That is so good. That is so good. Oh, you may be seated. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're, if I was placing Joshua in the Bible, I'd put Genesis, Exodus, Joshua. That's where I'd put it if I was. Of course, I know the other two are connected to really Exodus and Genesis, but if I was, because I want you to understand the Exodus is over and now Joshua is in a moment, a great moment of transition and when the Lord speaks to him and renews the promise that he gave to Moses, gives it to Joshua, tells him wherever your foot will step in the land, I'm going to give that to you. Can you imagine a tremendous, tremendous promise that he made to Joshua? He said, I'm going to give you real estate, a big family, and a lot of wealth. How many would like to have that? Are oh, you a bunch of lies. I'm telling you what, I, come on. Wouldn't we all love to have that? Man, I'm telling you. And so he renews that with him. And then, of course, uh, he sends spies just like Moses did. And then we have chapter 3 starting. It tells us this early the next morning, Joshua and all the Israelites left the Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River, just like Moses arrived at the Red Sea, and where they camped before crossing. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp, giving the instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, when you see the presence go before you, move out from your positions and follow what we believe is the presence of God that is wrapped up in the Ark of the Covenant. Follow the presence. Since you have never traveled this way before how do you go where you've never been before follow the presence of the lord they will guide you stay about a half mile behind them keeping a clear distance between you and the ark make sure you don't come any closer joshua told the people purify consecrate we're it's, it's several times different translations use purify consecrate sanctify yourself for what tomorrow the lord will do great wonders among you so we know that israelites leaving egypt they, they arrived there in the desert, and they took a wrong turn, and they 40 years, 40 years, can you imagine, 40 years wandered in the wilderness, and then a new moment came. You know, the next big thing in God, the next thing in God for you, the next thing in God for you, for your life, the next thing in God for me, it always seems to lie just beyond the next season, the next decision, the next battle, the next... Uh, conflict, the next victory, the next challenge, right before, same way for this church also. But as it was in Moses, as it was with Joshua, it's never new. It's just another season, a new one. And what others have gone through, we will have gone through. And because we know something about this, we know God is faithful. But when that moment comes, the unknown, the uncertainty, the unexplored, it can often paralyze and cause us fear. And we can always resist we can always resist what we don't understand. We can always criticize what we're not aware of and what we're not fully, uh, you know, have never been that way or something like that. It's just human nature to do that because change is really a challenge. To ever receive anything God wants in your life for your future, you have to go through a thing called change because no one, turn your neighbor and say, nobody likes change. Now, wait a sec, that's not true. Uh, the only one that likes change is a wet baby. And they let everybody know it. Isn't that right? They let everybody know it. Okay? But it's true. No, nobody really does. And so t if it's going to be moving toward the will of God and, and regardless of whatever, then we need a confidence and a hope that's based on the goodness of God. If I could tell you what the last few years in one theme, you'd say to me, how, how about the last four years? How's it been? I'm going to tell you my thing. I believe this. The goodness of God has shown itself. God is good. I'm telling you all the time God is good. Come on now. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. You'll never be able to. to and now the enemy wants to believe and cause you to think and otherwise that God's doing something to you when often he's doing something for you. And yet he will hold his very, you know, uh, character at your very feet trying to get you to, to charge God at, with a fault. But if we're going to embrace our future, we've got to embrace it knowing who God is and having a confident hope. That's why I love Hebrews chapter 6. It was actually this phrase that began it all. It was the partial verse, last part of verse 18. It says, therefore, therefore, anytime you see a therefore, what do we do? We stop and see what's there for. Well, it's about God made a promise. 
And now God's made another promise to Joshua. Same promise he made to Mo Moses. And it says that he just, he just started talking about the promise and God made an oath to fulfill his promise. Therefore, we who have fled to Jesus. And that phrase just struck me with such joy in my heart. I want to be known that I have fled to Jesus. Have you fled? People say, I, I'm not sure what it means to be saved. I'll tell you what it means to be saved. We who have fled to Jesus. When you flee to Jesus and put your confidence and trust in Him, then that's what it is to be saved. You turn your back on anything else you've trusted, and you know that nothing can give you relief. All they can give you, you know, all you can get a little bit of a, out of a bottle to give you a little bit of relief for a day and give you a lot of pain for tomorrow. You can do a lot of things that give you temporary relief. You can go spend thousands of dollars and try to get somebody to convince you that you're not okay. You know, guy wrote a book, I'm okay, you're okay. Eric Byrne wrote that book, I've got a master's degree. I know all about that, don't come talk to me about it. I understand that, there's some wonderful principles there, but I'm, I wasn't okay. And I wasn't okay till Jesus said I was okay. Come on. I'm going to try to help me, I need, I need to hurry, so... He said, they who ran for him for refuge, what? Can have great confidence. Can have a great confidence. Those who have run to Jesus <clears throat> can have a great confidence. So our confidence is in whom we have run to. He said this, what? Because as we hold to the hope that lies before us. So hope, hope helps us to hold on to something that's ahead of us. Hope is futuristic. Faith is right now. Now faith is. The substance of that which you're reaching for. Right now it's water. <laughs> it's okay, brother. Come on. Stick with me. I'm trying to hurry, but you got to help me. As we reach... He calls it a hope. He says, oh, I love this. Hold to the hope that lies before us. What about that hope? This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. I spent some time on an aircraft carrier in San Diego and got to go all over. Man, some of the ret retired, wonderful veterans of the Navy all was stationed all over the place. And they would tell you, many of them had been on that very ship, and as we were on the bridge and we got to the place where the anchors, he said we got four anchors and told us how much weight they were. And then he asked the question, you know, what's the most important part about the anchor system? And I went, in my mind going, anchor, duh. But I thought, I'm not going to say something stupid because this is a setup. So I waited till the man next to me went, anchor, duh. And he went, no. Almost like, he, you know, he's teaching us something. He's almost half mad. No, it's the, it's the chain. Because if the chain don't hold the anchor, the anchor won't stay in place. It's your hope that reaches. I want to strengthen that chain in you today. Because I know God will never fail you. But if you let loose of him and quit holding on to him, it won't be that, you, that he failed you. It will be that you failed your faith. No, no, we want to strengthen that hold today. Why? It's a trustworthy anchor for your souls. Now, it's the Greek, from the Greeks we learn body, soul, and spirit. And, you know, there was a whole teaching that had to be countered in the New Testament that, you know, well, you can do something with your body, but it doesn't really affect your soul or your spirit. How many knows that is unequivocally not true, not true. Still heresy. Keeps coming around. You know, heresy is old lies repackaged for a new generation. And so it's just, no, listen, if I, if I, if I stick a needle into, a, into an apple, I'm going to reach all the way from the outer side of its flesh, all the way to the inner side, all the way to the core. Well, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, if, if someone would just haul off and slap you, guess what? You're going to feel that in your body, soul, and spirit. And you're going to have to pray in the spirit to say, Lord, help me not to do it. I'll turn the other one. Okay. Now, come on, I'm, I'm saying that it's an effect on your life. An effect on your life. So the soul, he says what? How do, you, how do you emotionally stay attached? How do you intellectually stay? How about your will? The soul is the, the seat of the intellect, will, and, and of the thoughts and the mind. We call it the soul. He's a trustworthy anchor of your soul. And uh, it leads us through 
the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. So there's always something in the future, always. And I love this. Oh, it's so much joy to me. And verse 20, and Jesus has already gone in there for us. So he's already ahead of you. Jesus is here in this moment. He's in your present and he's in your future. He's already there. He's, he's given, and all that God was saying, hey, I give you an exchange for you then to follow my leading and all I want from you is loving obedience. And it still is the same. It was the same in the old, it's the same today. Loving obedience. But you, if you don't know this word, you don't know how to obey God. And if you don't know what this word says, you don't even know when you get in trouble. If you don't know this word, you don't know how it costs. Culture is going to help you. Culture is going to support things that God doesn't approve. And so you got to know the word of God to be able to obey him. And when you love him, he'll make sure that you will know the word of God. And he'll make sure. That's why. Here's the verse. Here's the ver verse for the season. You're going to see it pop up on what's in every message right now. And, and, and to however how long I feel like the Holy Spirit wants us to do this. But it's Jeremiah 29, 11. Everybody in the room, you got to put this one into your memory. you got to make sure. I mean... Take your neighbor's Bible, if you don't mark in yours, just take your neighbor's and mark in theirs or, or whatever. Or, or, and now your electronics, you, know, you can hold it down and, and, and highlight it and stuff. Highlight this verse. Why? Because for I know the plans I have you, says the Lord. Now, I can tell you I got plans for you, and you go, well, who are you? That's probably true. I mean, but I, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Do you know the devil has plans for you? I can tell you the end of it. I don't know exactly how he's going. But his destination is that he might steal, kill, and destroy you. Okay? So he's got plans to do that out of your life. But I know the plans I have for you, the Lord says. Well, they're plans for your good. For your good and not for disaster. I love that I memorized this in another translation. said evil. I, I, I like the word disaster. After going through the tornado, I know what a disaster is now. And God has plans not to tear me down but to build me up. And God has plans for you, for your good, to give you a what? A future and a hope. A future and a hope. Listen, in just another month from this Sunday right now, we're going to have Johannes here. And we had him two years ago. Had more people saved in one week than we did the previous four years. And then last year happened. How many's in the room? Was in the room a year ago when we had five weeks with Johannes and Emily Fitzer. Okay, a lot of good, wonderful hands. And I told them two years ago. I told them last year. And I'm telling you now, if you will bring a friend, relative, neighbor, I believe that the theme of this is really true. True. They'll get some hope. They may get healing. Yeah, we're believing God for healing. We believe in the physical healing of the Lord Jesus by his work on the cross. He still touches people. We believe God still heals people. We do believe that. And, and, we, and when, you, when you need healing, you want it any way you can get it, any way you can come. But we want God to do it. We had many, we have verified things last year where doctors even wrote letters saying we, we canceled surgery from the reversal and from the healing effect. And we had, we had several that said we know it has to be a nothing short of a miracle and we thank God for that so here's what we're gonna do would you would you pray about putting four names on this card that you would like to invite and as you do that if you'll fill out one for yourself and one for others put it in an offering at any time uh, we'll we come by you can lay them right here on this platform keep one give us one so that we can pray all month long for those you are being you are inviting because why cause the theme Hope and healing. You say, well, that was the same thing as last year. I know, but we got really creative. Hope and healing, 24. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, it was, it's not 23. It's this year. You know how hard it is to get people to live in the now? Right now. It's this year. And we believe we could not in any way improve on what God, I mean, we just believe we nailed it with that phrase. And we believe every time that God, why? Because he needs to get Ephesians 4 says, God gives. God gives apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. So we have a gift coming in a month. Why wouldn't you want to share that gift with somebody else? How many will do this? Won't you give me a hand clap that you'll, you'll do that? I just want to hear it. I want to hear it. Oh, I'm telling you. Just wait till I get that first service. I'm going to brag on y'all like crazy. Here's this. I know this is a long front porch, but the back porch is real short. And Okay, here it is. Hope is found on the ground floor of reality. If you don't come to reality, 
you don't have the basis of a real hope. And so this message today and what I'm starting, I never hardly ever get to finish anything with this, is that reality, when you, you know, well, don't be cruel when you give people reality. No, I, I know, but isn't it cruel to keep people from reality? And so reality can often feel like hopelessness. But see, hopelessness is the basis of when real hope can begin. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment. In these next five, ten minutes, Lord, I can't be long, but I ask you to maximize it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're calling this hope, hunger, and holy because that's what we believe that this season's about. Hope as in God do we have a real hope in you and what we're doing and what we, yes, we do. We believe that. And I believe it for you. I want you to have a hope that God is leading you right where you are in whatever relationship, whatever job, whatever home, whatever, whatever you're doing, whatever challenge is in front of you, your physical challenge, whatever, that you've got a hope and the real hope in God. But you have a hunger for Him so that He can give you the strategy that you need and that you would often, God will use everything in our life to bring transformation. We call it that he might purify us, that he might bring us through the fire, that he might bring us through that season, that he might set us apart as someone who's been through something and be able to talk about it and tell about it. And that's what holy does. That he is, justifies us. He puts us in right standing from him. And then he begins to work on us. And often, long after all the outside things fall off that you, know, you, know, you weren't supposed to do and all this kind of thing, you can imagine if you grew up in any kind of Pentecostal church, let's say 50 years ago or 40 years ago, man, you got the Bible and a lot of other stuff along with it. I mean to tell you. And so that process of coming to finding the grace of God and being transformed, that's what we want to say. We want to say, what is the hope based on? Hebrews 6 reminds us that we can see reality and not have a baseless hope. Because why? Hope buys time and spends it on a promise. Listen to me. Hope buying time. When people are hoping and waiting, they're spending their time. They're spending their life. And they are what? There's a promise before them. That's why Proverbs 13, 12 says hope deferred, hope prolonged, hope not answered, hope not, hope not realized, hope deferred makes the heart what? Sick. You ever been sick over a promise? Over a, come on, anybody? Okay. But a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. So hope buys time and spends it. And so we ask God, help us. Help us to make sure that our hope is designed by you to give us more time and to keep waiting on you and trusting on you. But hope that is not anchored in Jesus, hope that is not at the base of reality is not hope at all. It's wishing disguised as hope. Let me take a moment really quick right there to say wishing is a desired expectation. It's wishing is, I, I want something to happen in, in the future. I'm, I'm wishing, I, and we call it, sometimes we say hope when we really mean wishing. But real hope has some grounds to believe it. Something in the future that will occur. Because if you lead somebody down a, a hope, down a road called hope, and there's nothing at the end of that road, then that's the, kind of, that's the worst, cruelest thing you can ever do. It's causing them to believe something that, well, not, you're spending your time on something. I, uh, man, just went through a season over about a decade where our church would grow like crazy during our young days of our life and uh, go over so much. They only had so many parking spaces. So people are parking up and down the streets. Neighbors are complaining. Police keep coming over and over and over. Every time we got over a certain level. And so we did it three times. And we buy this property, huge, 100 acres, two mountains. Start taking people out to the property. I want them to sit old logging road looking over just like this, looking over that property. And the man who was the patriarch of the church, who didn't have a position but had more influence than anybody, he in front of everybody just stood up and he just kind of waved it off and said, said, Pastor, just forget it. You'll never be able to afford the road. And I'll, I'll never forget how hopeless I felt at that moment. I'm thinking, Lord, I've, I've spent, you know, nearly at this time, nearly 10 years of my life and, 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 and I'm, I, I'm trying to do something that can't be done right here. And we buy this 100 acres, and now we can't even afford the road. And I went back, and I, I mean, I poured my heart. My hunger drew me back to the one who gave me the promise of that property. He spoke to me about that property when I was in India in 93, in 1993. And I, we're, we're in this moment. Now it's 96. We done got the property. And we were, we were just trying to do something. And so I cried out to God, and you know what he said? Nothing. 
Because if God gives you a promise, he don't have to repeat his words. He, he is intending on bringing that promise together. He's intending on fulfilling his word. And he don't need to listen to your neurotic uh, 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 nerves and your worry and your doubt and your fresh no he goes no i'm gonna do it with you or without you but i'm gonna do it i am confident today there were a church been on that property with me or without me because god spoke in fact i had a man bring me a west virginia history book and the chapter three of that book says campaigning in the land of promise and they describe that property where the troops the northern troops would back up in that property and there they declared it no war could happen right there it was a place of rest and that was the property already prophesied about years before and god ever and god did it so I, what do i do and then three years later Three years later, the state of West Virginia announces, we're coming through this property. We're going to have to build a road right through your property, and we're going to take care of it when we need the snow removal. And, and I, I'm telling you, God is going to do it. It's not no, anything. I know I'm just foolishness to believe when God speaks it. you got the grounds to believe it and trust him and do that. But false hope, what? It calls you to spend your life over and over because if you don't see reality, the greatest problem it can be your greatest opportunity if you only get to the ground floor called reality. See, often if you don't know where you're going, you'll get there every time. Hope is not a strategy, folks. It's not a strategy. It comes as a reality that God has given you a strategy to be able to go in the direction that he's pointed in. You know what the you know why when you get saved you call we call it repent. It's so wonderful that repentance, man. We need to fall in love with that word. Why? Cause when you repent, you got to go back up again. In fact, repentance means to turn around. And when you come to Jesus, you turn around. And so repentance, having turned around, I'm now heading in the strategy. This is the strategy God has for me. And he's going to use the body of Christ and everything else to bring me in line to the image of Christ. And so when I confidence comes, when I'm following him and the witness of his presence comes to my heart, it's the gripping of the word of God and holding on. Your next state, step of faith might be exactly where you are where you maximize the moment and place you are and get yourself ready for the next place that god comes to comes on down how hungry are you how hungry are you everybody's hungry about something come on how hungry are you finally hopelessness can be the ground for a faith then Faith, it's a big change motivator. When I come to that moment and say, waiting and waiting, God, is this what you want me waiting on? Is this, you know I mean, I face reality. I feel the hopelessness. Now, am, am I going to keep doing and waiting and keep doing and waiting? You know what that's called? Over and over and doing the same thing and what? Expecting different results? No, no, no. We're going to trust him that when we have run to Jesus, and we have received his strategy. We know exactly where he is. Ver chapter 3, verse 5 tells us, purify yourself. Purify yourself. Purify. Tomorrow, the Lord will do great wonders. So I want you to take something out and write these down. Put it in your phone. Write it somewhere. I want, these are the three greatest questions he might ever ask you about your future. The three greatest questions. I promise you. I promise you. We're, we're concluding. This is, going to be the, this is going to be the conclusion to this message real quickly right here. I usually don't take really, I, I usually take weeks when I'm working with somebody to get through this. Because you've got to know, number one, what do you want? You know, you know, that's the question people don't understand. People don't, they don't really know what they want. I want it all. No, the, the world is, oh, you can have it all. No, you can't have it all all the time. You might have it all over a lifetime, but you can't have it all all the time. What do you want? you got to really know yourself to the place, what, Lord, what do you want? What do you want? It's, 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 it's the, what we've been working through for four years about what do we want? What do we see? And God's showing us what do we want. Even, even delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the want to. He'll give you the want of your heart. What do you want? What do you want? I want to, I, I want to, I want to, uh, I want, a, high I want a, a job, I want a degree, I want a relationship, I want to, uh, what do you want? What do you want? Second question. You're getting them so quickly. Now listen, do you not write these down and use them on somebody else. This is for you. That's what I want. 
I want you to come to Jesus in your life. What do I want? Number two, what does it cost? What does it cost? I, um, oh my, so, so fast. The clock moves so fast. So a young couple uh, is scheduled to be wet married this particular year. And the woman who did all of my premarital and everything, she, she said, Pastor, I just need you to meet this couple. I said, I know. And I, I almost said, I know her. I didn't know him, but I, I know she's a sweetheart in our church. And, and no, I just want you. Uh, he's coming in this weekend. Wedding's next weekend. I've set it up for Monday evening. Would you play? I said, yes, let's, let's do it. So I met with him. I immediately was feeling something. So I sent her out of the room and I said to him, he's coming from St. Louis. I said, hey, uh, did you leave work on Friday early? Did you tell everybody I'm going to get my bride? He went. I said, no. Did you, did you like leave early? Did you just barely on the border of getting a ticket? Because you could hardly. Did you go straight instead of your mama's? Did you go straight to her? And no, oh, she came over. She came over to that. I, I, I kept asking those kind of, you know what I was looking, asking? Do you want this bride? Do you want her? Do you want her? I kept asking. Finally, I said to him, hey, if you knew she'd be okay, would you call this wedding off? He shook his head, yes. Now, I knew right then, I've had great respect for him because he did that. But he was just a young man. No one would have given him permission. So I sent him out, brought her in, said, honey, this is not going to happen. He does not. And she's crying. She said, I knew something this weekend was off. She's married today, got beautiful children. She's so blessed. She's gorgeous, and we love her so much, and we're so proud of her. She got a great new day. But in that moment, you know what he was saying? I do not and will not pay the price. The cost of, I don't, I'm not, my mother is making me do this. I don't want her for, but my mother, so I'm not going to pay no costs. Listen, if he's not paying a price for you, you know, honey, if he's not pursuing you with time and attention and love and respect, he, I mean, he thinks he's already sold himself to you and that, that he's the, God, listen to me, run. Come on. You know, it's all about, what, what do you mean? Well, what does it cost? Time, anything that's worth money. What does it cost? I want, I want this, I want this powerful moment i want a great and awesome church time money change uh, everything costs i'll tell you uh, i i got a musical family my dad could play anything i got a sister and a brother that can play some of us can't but i wanted to play and i, I said it out loud i shouldn't have said it out loud because i wanted it out loud and said to my mom i, I want to learn how to play the piano i want to play the piano so she she found the only piano teacher in the area uh, Miss Armstrong, Miss Armstrong was the wife of the man who owned the funeral home. So where do you think the piano was? It was on the wall where the piano sit, and around the walls where the bodies were. And I had to go every Tuesday afternoon and sit there at that piano with my peripheral looking into where they did the funerals. And I'm scared to death already, 10, 11 years, I don't know, it might have been 12 years old. And I'm like, ah, I'm, this ain't happening. Thank God I love Miss Armstrong. She called my mother after a few weeks and said, Dear Lord, this is not going to happen. That boy ain't going to learn to play no piano. I said, Thank the Lord. Then I became about 40, and I revisited that, that dream. So Betty lived on the corner, and she was a phenomenal piano player. Everyone told me about concert piano, and she's just so sweet out in the community. And you just saw one car after another. She's teaching piano lessons. So I pulled up there one day, and I rolled my window. I said, hey, Miss Betty. And she knew me, uh, her family. Uh, I think Phyllis had worked with her, one of her uh, son's wife or something like that. We just knew in the community. I said, Miss Betty, I want to learn how to play the piano. And I could hardly get it out of my mouth. She went, oh, dear God, you ain't going to learn no piano, piano. Get your nose in that Bible. You, God's raised you up. I, we need to hear the word of God out of you. You, you quit that. You just need to stop talking about it. Have, have you talked about this very long? They look at you. You're 40 and you want to learn the piano. She said, no, no, you need to preach like you've never preached before. I've always thanked God for Miss Betty. She brought reality to me. 
You said, I'm 40 and I, I can't learn how to something. Yeah, you can learn if you want it bad enough. She just knew me that I didn't have the time. It was a cost factor for me. Are you ready for the third question? It's the most important three questions you may ever ask. When are you willing to pay the price? First, you've got to find out what you want. Then you've got to find out what the cost is. Oh, you've got to find out what the cost is. I have many who will saddle up beside me and say, you know what, I want to I wanna go speak to 500 pastors in Tanzania. And I, I want to say to them, then maybe you've got a few years of costs you've got to pay. I want your anointing. Pat, well, you don't want the cost of that. God has your call and what He wants. Find out what God wants and never let it go. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Because no one will have more of a heart for you and what I want for you as much as I do. No one. And my servant has delivered the word to you because I'm calling you. I'm reaching for you. I have not only for you the destination but it really is as much about the journey as it is the destination because I could bring you there overnight I can drop I can put gifts in you overnight or I can develop those gifts in time I can bring you to a moment in an instant or I can bring you through the moment as my work is being done in you and others see the glory of the transformation of my presence in your life so be that be that very moment yes hope is my desire for you and my hope is extended to you my son is my greatest hope for you my son is the embodiment of my hope for you and the moment that we are gathered together and pulled that the body of my son off of this planet we call it the blessed hope and my hope and life for you is for to build you up and stir you up and to give you a more fulfilling life your best life now is found in my presence not in someone else's guru teaching not in someone else's words that are trying to manipulate you and try to get you feel good no you need to know that my best life for you is in the center of my wheel and I want it for you I want it for you more than you'll ever know in Jesus name thank you Lord